Renaissance people. If you are enjoying the Italian Renaissance podcast, I have good news. We're now active on Patreon. You can show your love for the show by becoming a patron and get access to additional resources, information, and artworks. Better yet, those who join the Renaissance Master or Renaissance Patron tier will get access to at least one additional podcast episode each month. My goal is to ensure that the main podcast remains a free, accessible source for everyone. Become a patron today through the link in the show notes to support the continued production of new episodes and help build and maintain this community. The Italian Renaissance Shop is now also active on Etsy, linked in the show notes. Sport our logo or choose from a growing selection of Italian art-inspired designs. Discounts are offered to select Patreon tiers as well. Your support has my immortal gratitude. Now, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Italian Renaissance Podcast, where we discuss essential topics about the art and culture of 15th and 16th century Italy. I'm your host, Lawrence Cianangeli. Andiamo avanti. I hope everyone has had a pleasant two weeks since our last episode on Leonardo da Vinci. I also hope you had a chance to look at the various images I posted, especially some of the less popular images from him, though I've noticed uh, a lot of my viewership is um, larger than the actual numbers of my following on social media. So if you have a chance, find us on Instagram or Facebook. You can find all those links in the show notes or on the main Buzzsprout website. If you do follow me on Instagram or Facebook, you've probably seen that I've put up a lot of posts by women artists from the Renaissance through the Baroque period, um, namely because we traveled to Detroit for a consulate appointment and ended up going to the Detroit Institute of the Arts, which is an absolutely fantastic, incredible, and exceptional collection. But they had a special exhibit titled By Her Hand, particularly um, pertaining to Artemisia Gentileschi, the megalithic Baroque painter. But they also had um, artists on display that are all female painters in or around the same period, the 1600s, including a very important Renaissance painter, painter excuse me, named Sofonisba Anguissola. So I put up some of these images just to, 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 to show what we were up to in Detroit. Um, I was going to do this episode on that exhibit, but there are people out there that I really want to cover Sofonisba with. And if the I can be permitted to talk about Artemisia, even though she's not necessarily a Renaissance painter, um, there are people I want to do those projects with that are in the middle of things, and right now we, we can't get to them. But the future of this show does include these fantastic painters, and I want to not focus on all of these men as much, um, and it's going to happen. That's my promise to you guys. I've been hesitant to do an episode on Michelangelo for a few reasons. One, there's just too much to say, and it isn't easy condensing Michelangelo into a single digestible dose. This means that we'll have to be general, and in this case, we're going to only cover the young Michelangelo. Everything that's happening in his life up to or before he gets notorious among art patrons. And for later episodes, several will do detailed discussions on works by Michelangelo, uh, the latter half of his life, probably in, in digestible chunks. The second reason is that there's no doubt that Michelangelo is the golden boy of the Renaissance. This comes with the problem of absolutely needing to cover him, his life, his works, but also realizing that can be extremely difficult and complicated. He was an excellent storyteller, as in he didn't always tell the truth, and was intent on crafting a legendary tale for himself and trying to cover up the historical truth. While that makes his endeavor fun, it's also perilous, right? We'll see. And three, probably a very minor reason for my hesitation to cover who would be the most dynamic artist of his time, is that, funnily, um, I don't think funnily is a word. 
uh, I'm not editing that out. Funny enough is that the graduate, uh, a graduate advisor once said to me, mind you, this was in a conversation I had and never even mentioned Michelangelo, but she said to me, and I quote, Renaissance art isn't all Michelangelo. Just like that. I had a good guess of what she was insinuating, and that has unfortunately made me want to avoid him at all costs. This idea that... Um, actual scholarship of the renaissance has to somehow go around the major players so that you can um, be taken seriously right but alas here we are and frankly i don't feel like this is inappropriate but rather wholly important and necessary for a show called the italian renaissance podcast to talk about michelangelo buonarroti so let's do it but we have to do this knowing it is an introduction to him like we did with leonardo and I only plan on covering the beginning of his life, and this comes with a lot of fascinating stories. Michelangelo was born in March of 1475 in the town of Caprese near Arezzo. This area is not far from Florence, where the family relocated um, while the artist was still very young. Today, he's most famous for his work as the painter of the Sistine Chapel in Rome. One key takeaway here, Michelangelo hated painting, did not consider himself a painter necessarily, and absolutely values sculpture as a higher form of art. Quote that, save it, highlight it in your brain. He was likewise more than a sculptor. He was an excellent poet and architect. He spent a great deal of time working with actual human corpses in order to render his anatomy as accurately as possible too. So he was an exceptional anatomist. In spite of all this, he began his career as a painter. Moving to Florence as a young man, he became an apprentice in the workshop of Domenico Ghirlandaio, the same painter we discussed in episode 2 and elsewhere. Michelangelo was inclined towards art even as a young child. He was only 13 when he entered the workshop of one of the most important painters in Florence, Ghirlandaio, right? We have to put a pin here because we can guess that Michelangelo learned, at least in part, the fresco technique while studying under Ghirlandaio. However, it won't be for another couple of decades until he would use it in Rome for the Sistine ceiling. So, we are in the years following the infamous Pazzi conspiracy, and Lorenzo the Magnificent, that is Lorenzo de Medici, is in a way a de facto leader of Florence, and ultimately has a hand in grooming Michelangelo towards success. Not far from the Medici Palace, close to the convent of San Marco in Florence, Lorenzo had founded his very famous sculpture garden. While it was like most gardens in Florence, private and closed behind stone walls, it, it had gained a sort of fame for its hidden beauty and being adorned with classical sculpture that the Medici family had collected from ancient Rome. Lorenzo is best known as a patron of the arts, a major player in terms of humanist revival, grand collector of antiquities, and a key financial provider for Florentine artists. It is said that even Leonardo da Vinci and Verrocchio honed their craft in the Medici garden. The sculpture collection in the garden was used as models by the artists of the period, and this helped further bolster the revival of classical antiquity that we are calling the Renaissance. I want to stress that while the Renaissance is principally a cultural phenomenon that is in part passive, there are moments of extreme intention, as we'll see here with the garden, that should be considered an essential piece of the formation of Renaissance art. Whether Lorenzo was a man who highly valued the arts, I think he was or a man who held art as a propaganda value for his family pride and his covert rule, that question is still up for debate, but it's not our question today. One of the complications of unpacking Michelangelo's life is that we have a lot of source material available, and some that is often contradictory. Of course, Giorgio Vasari wrote of Michelangelo as the greatest artist of his day. We all know Vasari by now, I would hope. However, Michelangelo was concerned with crafting his own image. I promise this is going to circle back to the Medici Garden, but we have to take this small detour. In the mid-1500s, long after the period in question, Michelangelo meets Ascanio Condivi, who is tasked with 
writing the biography of Michelangelo as Michelangelo wanted it. Mind you, he lived a very long life, Michelangelo, from 1475 to 1564. So he was 88 years old when he died. Michelangelo was not happy with all of the details of his life by Vasari. Namely, he was interested in mythologizing himself through Condivi, his biographer. Later in his life, Michelangelo was known to do this sort of thing, hoping that his legacy would show him as naturally inclined to art, as if divine, with no training from anyone. He's even known to have destroyed his composite sketches and his drafts uh, or his clay models from his sculptures in order to eliminate any evidence of his process. So in this vein, Michelangelo protests the biography by Vasari, who clearly indicates him as a student of Ghirlandaio. Condivi would propose him as one who learned on his own, gifted in the arts naturally rather than by the rigorous education process of the Renaissance bottega. Remember the word bottega refers to a workshop of an artist. Vasari and Condivi both bring us accounts of the Medici garden, here we are, that are similar and different. Let's look at those. According to Vasari, Lorenzo the Magnificent was not pleased that the Florentine Republic so successfully produced renowned painters, but that it lacked so heavily in skilled sculptors. He thus appealed to Ghirlandaio, going to his workshop, to send any of his pupils that he felt were inclined towards sculpture. This, according to Vasari, is how Michelangelo wound up as a student of sculpture in the Medici Garden. Condivi tells another tale, where the aimless Michelangelo is taken to the Medici Garden by his friend Francesco Granacci, who just so happens to be one of the young artists who was a pupil of Ghirlandaio. I think it's clear that Michelangelo, through Condivi, wants to admit that he was trained while maintaining the truth that, as a young student, he, along with pupils of Ghirlandaio, who were not him, according to him, but probably was him, <laughs> were sent to the Medici Garden to train in sculpture, using all of the classical references to hone their craft at the behest of Lorenzo the Magnificent, who wanted to elevate the status of Florentine sculpture. And boy, did it work. This is where the stories of Vasari and Condivi converge, aligning in almost every detail. They tell of the first meeting of Lorenzo the Magnificent and the young Michelangelo. At his apparent first attempt at sculpting ever, the first time the artist picked up his chisel, he attempted to copy the head of an old fawn in marble and did so very accurately in nearly every detail, working at it for several days. And as he worked, he began to introduce new elements to the work, opening its mouth and using his imagination to supply the work with character and detail, including deep wrinkles, a tongue, a full set of teeth, but these were not present in the work that he was copying. When he was nearly finished is when Lorenzo first appeared in the garden. He was astonished at the boy's work. Both accounts, Vasari and Condivi, relate Lorenzo as laughing a lot, as being a joyous person, and that being his typical demeanor. So there he told the young Michelangelo that it was unlikely that such an old fawn would still have all of its teeth, as anyone that age is bound to have lost a few. Right, Lorenzo the Magnificent thought it was funny that Michelangelo had included all of the fawn's teeth. So, returning to his work, Michelangelo carved out the front tooth going so far as to make a hole in the gums where the root of the tooth would have been. At the completion of this work, his first ever sculpture, Lorenzo summoned Michelangelo's father, Ludovico, and asked to have Michelangelo, to live in his palace, to be among his children, and to train with his circle of scholars. Ludovico accepted, and so Michelangelo came under the elite care of Lorenzo the Magnificent. We need to start tracing lines of influence here. Lorenzo had brought in 
Bertoldo di Giovanni as a teacher in his garden. Bertoldo was a student of Donatello, the most influential sculptor of his time, and one of the close friends of Lorenzo's grandfather, Cosimo de' Medici. It is possible that Lorenzo wanted to tap into whatever energy Donatello put into his sculptures in order to pass it from Donatello to Bertoldo to this new generation of artists that he had recruited to learn in his garden. It was common for students of art to have visited frescoes throughout the city to emulate their forms and anatomy. They may go to Santa Croce, for example, to view the frescoes of Giotto and try to draw them, try to learn how to do it correctly. In one famous outing to the Brancacci Chapel, where the students were taken to try their hand at the excellent forms of Masaccio, a notorious incident occurred. While the young sculptor Pietro Torrigiani was working on his sketches, Michelangelo had some harsh criticism for his drawing. Torrigiani, enraged, cocked his fist back and plowed Michelangelo in the face, breaking his nose. The result, as many claim, was a lifelong disfigurement of his nose that also appears in some of his portraits. I don't necessarily see a crooked nose when I look at his images, but it is possible that some correct the crooked nose when they depict him and others do not. I don't know. I'm not actually an expert in the depiction of Michelangelo's broken nose, but what we see here is one of several moments in which Michelangelo is um, a little antagonizing, right? He completed his first two works under Bertoldo, the Madonna della Scala, or the Madonna of the Stairs, and the Battle of Lapiths and Centaurs, both heavily influenced by classical examples and both showing an excellent aptitude for sculpture while not yet being perfect versions of his craft. I'll have images of those posted to the Instagram and Facebook soon. So don't believe the Michelangelo lies, people. Okay. Let's look at the Madonna of the Stairs. These Michelangelo stories keep getting more and more interesting. So he had a wet nurse as a baby. And for those unfamiliar with what a wet nurse is, it's a person hired to suckle infant children breastfeed them for any number of reasons. See, now I don't know, now that I'm saying that out loud, suckle infant children. That sounds like suckling is a passive, su suckling is a passive thing, not an active thing. It just sounds weird like that. In any case, they breastfeed children for people who can't, choose not to, what have you. So Michelangelo's wet nurse was from the village of Settignano, a small town of stone cutters on the outskirts of Florence. He believed that having drank the milk of a woman from a stone cutter's village gave him, at least in part, the gift of sculpting. He's always mythologizing himself, unlike Leonardo, who we did all the legend making for. So it's no surprise that one of his first major works is the Virgin Suckling the Christ Child. The Madonna of the Stairs is currently located in Florence in Casa Buonarroti, a house that Michelangelo never actually lived in. It was completed likely at the end of the 1480s and is carved in marble. We've just covered what this type of depiction, uh, why it might be important to Michelangelo, but I want us to look at the image in detail, or at least have you hear me gripe about the details. No doubt, given his age, being so young, this is a skilled work. Yet, we can see that Michelangelo has not yet worked out his anatomy or his perspective. The Christ child has some Arnold Schwarzenegger arms, thrown back, kind of twisted behind him unnaturally, and it's, it's, it's odd to look at. I dream of having those back muscles, by the way. If you look at the Christ child, he's ripped. And the hand that cradles him by the Virgin is huge. And the Virgin has uh, the most undesirable cankles. I'm sorry. 
I think Michelangelo wanted to try his hand at foreshortening. That's adding depth to an object as if you're looking at it head on or almost head on. That's what foreshortening is. But his work here flattens out and makes her foot incredibly fat. That, along with that harsh 90-degree angle of her leg, makes it a very off-looking composition. So, perspective. It is called Madonna of the Stairs because there is a staircase in it, making up a large part of its composition. On this stair, there is some angel or another cloaking the Virgin. This figure is supposed to be set back in the image, but the perspective is all wrong, so it looks as if it's leaning in about to kiss Mary. With that said, now she looks like an enormous giant compared to the other figures because they aren't set back in the composition correctly. In other episodes, we've talked about optical compensation. I don't believe there's any way to optically compensate this work to make the perspective line up. Overall, the work completely lacks any elegance or grace, in my opinion, of course. Yet, it's not inexcusable for a novice artist. We just have to resist what Michelangelo wants us to believe about him, that he is a natural, divine artist, blessed at the teat of this stone-cutter wet nurse, and it was never trained, acquiring his talent by the grace of nature. It's just not true. We know the Medici founded the Neoplatonic Academy in Florence and that Michelangelo was certainly influenced by Neoplatonism while under the care of Lorenzo. But Lorenzo dies in 1492, and the Medici are expelled from Florence two years later in 1494. This is a pivotal moment for the young artist who is now in his 20s. Before the glorious work he does on the Pietà in Rome, or his David in Florence in this holy, amazing Bacchus, one of my favorites, before he is commissioned to do the tomb of Pope Julius II or to even paint the Sistine ceiling, these are all histories for future episodes. Michelangelo had a scheme in mind. His chief patrons were gone. He was by no means popular or sought after. As we said, there were not yet glorious sculptors in Florence at all, supposedly. That was Lorenzo's ambition. Most wealthy patrons were more interested in acquiring ancient Roman sculptures and paying very good money to grow their collections. So now Michelangelo would risk his entire career and this is the last work we'll cover on the young Michelangelo. He decided he would attempt to forge an ancient Roman statue to sell for profit. Thus, he sculpted what is known as the Sleeping Eros, or the Sleeping Cupid, now lost to history. Not only did he try to sculpt it as close as possible to mimic Roman sculpture, but he buried it in order to try to age the marble. His intention was to see if he could indeed mimic the ancients so closely that his own work would pass for an original Roman sculpture. So then it was likely sold to Baldassare del Milanesi, an art dealer, who then in turn sold it to the Cardinal Raffaele Riario, an influential art collector in Rome. It did not take long for Riario to notice it was a forgery and returned it to Baldassare. In a letter to Lorenzo di Pierfrancesco de' Medici, not Lorenzo the Magnificent, mind you, Michelangelo wrote of his heated exchange with Baldassare after Riario returned the statue. Michelangelo wrote this. Last Monday, I delivered your other letters to Pagolo Rucellai, who offered to place the money at my disposal and to Cavalcanti. These things are unrelated. Back to the letter. Afterwards, I gave the letter to Baldassare del Milanesi and asked him to give me back the Cupid. He's talking about the sleeping arrows. Saying that I was willing to refund the money. 
but he answered me only with rough words, saying he would rather break it into a hundred pieces. He had bought the bambino, he said, and it was therefore his. He had letters from the person to whom he sold it, showing that its new owner was well satisfied with his bargain, and he did not think he would be compelled to return it. Michelangelo then goes on to say, because he's always a little dramatic, he always likes to stir up a little bit of trouble, that Baldassare, um, he says, he complained bitterly of you, saying you had spoken ill of him. How about that? For some reason, I get the sense that Michelangelo was somewhat displeased that his own fraudulent scheme was being treated like this by the art dealer who would be in every right of his own to be upset at getting sold a fraudulent Roman antique. In the end, Michelangelo risked his entire career, though, with this bold and scandalous move. However, Cardinal Riario was actually impressed with Michelangelo's ability in sculpting the sleeping Eros. So, while he could have, and instead of ruining the artist who had not yet blossomed in his career at all, he decided to later commission him to sculpt what will be Michelangelo's famous Bacchus. And thus began the career of notoriety for the young Michelangelo. Following this would, would come the commission of the Pietà, one of his most adored sculptures in the Vatican today. Well, it's in, it's in uh, St. Peter's Basilica today, which is part of the Vatican. So I don't know why I corrected myself. It wasn't really a correction, just a specification, I suppose. So there's so much to say about Michelangelo. After this podcast, I hope you'll have a better understanding of his beginning, how he started, and all these wild stories that go along with it. Because he is a wild character to discuss, and the details of his life are often overshadowed by his grandiose commissions, which, in my opinion, are spectacular, but take up too much room when we're talking about Michelangelo. I don't want to present him to you as a refined and professional artist, but as he was in his youth, slightly irritating, quite dishonest, yet this adds to his dynamic character, for he was a character, no doubt. Can we see that now? From overriding his actual past in favor of his preferred past, to getting punched in the church for antagonizing people, to fabricating his first major work to only get a lucky break by an amused cardinal. These stories distance Michelangelo from the majesty of the Sistine ceiling, even though when we cover that, the stories are just as petty and just as insane. However, folks, the next episode, we are going to step away from Michelangelo, from art in general, and we're going to welcome a guest um, for the eighth episode of the podcast so that we can talk about Galileo and the new science of the Renaissance. Stay tuned. <laughs>